So um, thank you very much for coming to uh, uh, my presentation. And uh, I would like to thank previous speakers, uh, previous speaker, Human, uh, who introduced uh, the, the area, uh, which I'm also gonna be um, fo uh, focus my talk on. So today I'm going to talk about uh, amyloid fibrils, or more specifically, uh, the, the two keywords I'm gonna focus on is the, the fragmentation stabilities of uh, amyloid fibrils, as well as the polymorphic nature uh, so what do I what do I mean by these? Uh, so this talk, uh, because we are in a really nice workshop, uh, I think it's uh, uh, you know really nice to interact with uh, theoreticians and mathematicians. So I, I, I should I should start by thanking, of course, the organizers for orga uh, for organizing such a diverse uh, you know um, set of uh, talks, which is uh, has been really stimulating so far. So uh, thanks to the organizers for organizing this. Um, and I think uh, I think uh, the point of this workshop is also me trying to uh, explain a little bit what I think uh, is uh, the uh, you know uh, the future problems, if you will, that I think uh, could be very interesting uh, for 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 you guys doing theory for you guys to look at. Uh, so therefore, my talk is going to be a little bit of an overview uh, of uh, what we have done uh, over the past few years. Uh, rather than going into the details of individual stories, okay? So, um, and as before, if you got any questions, uh, feel free to just uh, give it a shout, uh, so we keep it very informal, and I think it's, it works really well. Uh, yeah, before I start, I also want to thank um, all the people's uh, uh, work contributing to the stuff that I'm gonna talk about, uh, both uh, present and past uh, team members, as well as uh, a lot of different collaborators and founding bodies. Uh, and uh, I would like to especially thank Marie and Magali, who is not here today, but nevertheless, uh, really, uh, I've uh, collaborated with uh, both of you for uh, really a lot, of, a lot of years. And I think for me, I've learned a lot, and I, th I think we all learned a lot about the system that, uh, uh, that I'm gonna talk about to the, the fragmentation of amyloid fibrils. <coughs> um, so a little bit about why we're interested in amyloid. I should start saying that uh, the aggregates, or some of the aggregates that Human talked about uh, in his talk, the, the prions, they are also uh, amyloid. Uh, not all. I think there is a lot of discussion of what is uh, the difference between prion and amyloid. I think that's actually quite controversial in many ways. But certainly some prion aggregates are certainly amyloid. Uh, so amyloid essentially uh, is defined by the cross beta structure. So um, if you are um, not familiar with the protein structures, essentially uh, chains of amino acid, they can be in uh, beta secondary structure. And these beta strands, uh, they can stack up uh, and uh, organize in a way perpendicular to the fiber axis. So that's the structural definition of amyloid. And, uh, and of course, some prion aggregates, they organize in that way. And therefore, we consider them to be uh, a, a type of amyloid too. <laughs> but there are, of course, other amyloid that's not prions. Uh, and they are even functional amyloid in the sense that they are not associated with disease. So while we are interested in amyloid, there's many different uh, areas, of course, uh, so, uh, of a very fundamental level, we want to understand how these uh, biological structures, how do they self-assemble from a very small building blocks, you know. So this self-assembly process itself is of academic interest, obviously. We want to know, understand more about why nature is able to, uh, you know, do this sort of uh, self-assembly process. And we are interested in the structure. I'm going to talk about the structure a lot because amyloid structures, uh, the major dip, one of the major differences between amyloid structures and normal globular proteins in the, is uh, so-called uh, polymorphism. Uh, and what does that mean? That means that if you have one uh, set of amino acid sequence, you can actually form many, many different types of structures. Uh, while as the globular proteins, uh, you know, uh, you probably heard about the Amphingsens experiment. Basically, you have one amino acid sequence tend to then go on to form one dominant uh, three-dimensional structure. For amyloid sequences, uh, sequences that, uh, amino acid sequences that form amyloid, you can, uh, from one sequence, self-assemble self into uh, a really arranged, large range of structures. So th this is a major difference, and this is uh, a phenomenon called polymorphism. 
Um, so from disease point of view, so uh, of course these amyloid structures can be, some of them are associated with the devastating human disease, such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Uh, transmissible prion disease such as CJD is of course also uh, very important uh, because uh, prions in that respect, uh, these particles, they are transmissible amyloid. And some amyloid are actually considered to be prion-like in the sense that they are not maybe associated with a prion disease, but they have properties, uh, more specifically the way they can be transmitted between at least cells uh, has, uh, you know, uh, has some similarity to uh, prions. Uh, like what I say here. So in this case, we are really interested in how do they propagate uh, the structure. So biological information is encoded in the structure and how do we propagate that information. Uh, and of course, the infective potential, you know, what makes certain amyloid a prion? I seeing, uh, you know, is that, is that because they're more infectious in some ways? And I, if that's the case, why? Uh, there are also uh, an, another area, independent of disease, so some of the amyloid um, material, if you will, uh, are actually, uh, so they are very common in biology, and then a lot of them are just not associated with disease, they actually perform um, biological functions. Uh, and of course, you can engineer amyloid material uh, because uh, they might have interesting, you know, mechanical properties uh, for technological um, applications. So actually, if you talk to people in that field, they will not refer amyloid fibrils as amyloid fibrils. They call them protein nanofibrils. Because if you see, if, it, if you talk about amyloid with, uh, uh, you know, with media or something, they immediately associate it with disease, even if there are a lot of amyloid that's not disease associated. So they want to get away with the, the name amyloid. They just call it protein nanofibrils or nanofilaments. <laughs> but anyway, so this is also a very big area. Um, yeah, so like what I said, some amyloid uh, structures, they are uh, associated with devastating human diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and we have the prion disease, for example, CJD, because uh, at least some prion particles, they are, uh, by structural definition, they are amyloid, and we're now seeing uh, quite, uh, at least three now we've seen, um, where the structure is confirmed to have this kind of uh, amyloid cross beta structure. So they are definitely uh, also a very important class of disease. <clears throat> now the assembly process uh, is a very complex and it's actually a slow process, uh, generally speaking, uh, which is kind of like good thing because you, you know, these diseases we're talking about, they are not uh, a acute disease. They're, they're usually age related. So even if you get the disease, it takes a while. Uh, it's, it's, we're talking about usually years. Um, so, uh, one aspect is, of course, the kinetic mechanism. How do these monomeric building blocks, uh, these proteins that normally are uh, monomeric, I think they, they are just uh, single protein chains, how do they actually assemble into various amyloid? So, the kinetic, the dynamics of that self-assembly process um, is, uh, I mean, to be honest, uh, we don't know nearly enough about it. It's, there's a lot of unknown questions. <clears throat> uh, and of course, uh, there's also the organization aspect. Uh, so I mean, the title of the workshop is talking about the you know, biological uh, self-assembly, so organization, right? Um, and uh, amyloid, uh, I'm gonna talk about the organization, the sort of structural aspect a lot uh, as well today, but essentially, uh, you can have amyloid of various size distributions, even if the actual structure in the core is the same, you can have different size distributions. And of course, the core doesn't have to be the same either, so you can have also uh, what we call the polymorph distribution as well, uh, <clears throat> which is kind of really new emergent properties that people look into these days. Um, yeah, so, so the, in my lab, we're really interested in the link between structure and biological um, properties, biological effect these uh, structures they, uh, they link, uh, link to. So, uh, so basically, um, structure activity relationship, if you will. Um, and over the years, uh, I've um, done a lot of different uh, areas look at possible links. Uh, I'm not going to talk in the detail about the experimental data in this case. I just refer to uh, these uh, separate studies. But if you guys are interested, I can talk to you uh, separately um, 
about more about this. But essentially, we look at, uh, for example, uh, size distribution of amyloid, how it affects cytotoxic potential of uh, these particles. Um, in this case, if you have very small active uh, species, they are more cytotoxic potentially. Uh, compared to if you have a size distribution that's very large. And has, uh, a lot of people have uh, done similar experiments now um, uh, over the years. Um, and uh, we also look at the infected, uh, infected pot uh, potential of prions. So in this case, we use the yeast prions a model system. And we look at really, uh, we're counting the particles, we look at the size distribution. And in this case, the, the number of particles is important, but there is of obviously the issue of how do they uh, in this case, for yeast prions, they have to get into the cell, so that there is a size cutoff as well. So we've looked into that. We've looked into uh, the, uh, the amyloid interactions with membranes and surfaces. Uh, in this case, we've seen uh, that uh, they, the different surfaces of amyloid, you have the end surface, you have the surface along the filament, they react differently to you know, biological surfaces. Uh, recently, we look at cross interaction between amyloid systems. Uh, and uh, this is uh, when you have uh, one type of amyloid, it can actually interact with a different amyloid system uh, in that way. So we look into that uh, very recently. Uh, we show that it is a very important aspect. And it might be very important to, because later on I'm going to show you that amyloid, they all have different structures individually. You know? And of course, uh, the, the, the key topics today, we're talking about the stability toward fragmentation. Uh, fragmentation is a way for filaments to divide and therefore a way to propagate the biological information. I, I mean, I know Human said that, that in prion disease, we don't actually know if uh, fragmentation is happening in an in vivo setting, okay? So I agree with that. I mean, there's a lot of unknown, but we haven't ruled it out either. There might be some, uh, you know, uh, enzymes in the cell, uh, some kind of chaperone system that does this. Uh, I mean, we just don't know enough. But nevertheless, I'm going to talk about the stability toward fragmentation. Uh, so this is a work that uh, is really, uh, has been really fruitful collaboration between me, uh, Maria uh, Magali, and also Miguel. Um, uh, for those of you who know who, uh, who Miguel Escobedo is, uh, has been really, uh, really good. We look, we look at pure fragmentation. Uh, the, the, um, the major driver is that in order to understand the kinetic processes, we designed the experiment to really just look at basically that process. So we basically designed the experiment specifically to isolate a fragmentation process for all the other things that might be going on. Okay, So that was the strategy. And of course, at the end, I'm going to talk about the structural polymorphism and what the relationship it might have to the strain phenomena. And this is about really about the structural organization. Um, uh, so this is a little bit of an introduction. So, uh, so that the, uh, of course, amyloid self-assembly is quite complex, uh, but you can, uh, at least the current knowledge uh, that we have, you can divide it into key uh, processes. So we have four key processes. We have the primary nucleation, so that's the birth process, if, if you will. And then we have uh, some kind of elongation. So of course, uh, uh, I agree with Human that it might not be a simple process as you adding on one monomer to the end, uh, but nevertheless, it's some kind of a, a growth where your fil filament is uh, getting longer uh, in a way. We have also uh, something called secondary processes. Uh, so one is secondary nucleation. So that's uh, the birth of new assemblies uh, that's been catalyzed by existing uh, assemblies. Uh, you do not have necessarily the same structure when you do that. So the biological information might not be conserved in this case, uh, and that's what we've shown uh, recently. Uh, and of course, you got the division process, so I also can uh, say that it's a fragmentation process, so I'm going to use those words quite interchangeably, I guess. So division is where you uh, have one parent particle and you divide them into two, and then therefore you in this case, you do preserve the biological information uh, so that the daughter particles will have the same uh, structure as the parent. Okay, so, so roughly you have this kind of a behavior and it's a positive uh, kind of feedback loop, right? So uh, if you have unlimited material, this is just gonna lead to exponential growth, okay? Uh, <coughs> uh, so in this, uh, um, talk, I'm basically going to focus in the division process because uh, I was very interested in it because I figure 
it's very important. It has two effects. One is it changes the size distribution of your particles. And we know that different size stuff has different activity in biology. If you got small stuff, uh, it might be very easy to avoid to move around and interact. While as if you have big stuff, it might not be as active. So size distribution change. Uh, the other one is obviously it's uh, gonna be uh, increasing the number of particles you've got. Uh, so the more number of stuff you've got, potentially, I mean, you just uh, like virus particles, right? You've got more of them, then you have high concentration of particles that could lead them into uh, more biological effects. So that's why I thought uh, why this fragmentation, so fibrillar division process is such, of such importance. Um, <clears throat> now in the uh, very old days, when we started doing this back uh, 15 years ago almost, uh, the only way to do it is uh, monitor growth curves. Uh, so you can do a concentration dependence uh, and uh, this is probably uh, the earliest uh, nice day that you can have a concentration dependence of amyloid growth, um, which uh, I've done with my own hands, uh, you know, 15 years ago. Um, but then the question is, if you want to uh, look at the fragmentation, is the information content of this data set enough? So I've convinced uh, people, I convinced Marie that no, 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 that's, you need more than that, okay? Simply because if you look at these um, sigmoidal shaped growth curves, in the beginning, very little happens. You have mainly some kind of a nucleation process, so that's the birth process uh, from, uh, from scratch. And then at the transition, you have a mixture uh, of different processes, all big arrows here. And at the end, you may have some processes uh, going on, but mainly you're gonna have uh, fragmentation left. So you really have a mishmash of all these things going on at the same time. And as an experimentalist, I didn't like that because uh, how do you then gonna get reliable information about the division process uh, when you have everything going on at the same time? So we basically designed the experiments uh, to just look at fragmentation. How we do that is we waited at the end, we took these uh, particles and we seeded. Uh, so we basically made really long filaments. And then once you put them there, the other processes will be very much uh, limited. And therefore the dominant process, uh, especially if you add perturbation, in this case we use mechanical perturbation, then you'll have a situation where everything is dominated by the fragmentation. So that's how we can then measure fragmentation stability of, uh, of the structures we're looking at. Uh, the questions we want to answer uh, is basically, uh, first of all, can we actually do these experiments in a sensible manner? Because uh, does it depend on uh, your starting distribution? You know, do we have to characterize that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have two different samples, can we compare between these samples, uh, even though they might not be exactly the same in terms of the size distribution? So there are a lot of questions. And then uh, next one is, can we extract meaningful intrinsic properties uh, that tells you something about amyloid, or at least extract intrinsic uh, properties in the sense that we can compare them, right? We want to know if some amyloid are more likely to break, uh, while as am other amyloid might be more stable. So that's why I uh, keep saying about fragmentation stability. And finally, we, uh, like what I said, we want to be able to compare and maybe say something about, um, uh, you know, uh, whether different amyloid or maybe even the same uh, amyloid type, so the same sequence, but a different, slightly different structure. W would they divide in any different ways, you know? Um, <clears throat> so to start with, uh, we use uh, atomic force microscopy, so AFM, to, uh, um, to basically under perturbation, we can use AFM to image our samples and therefore we can look at these particles and look at the size distribution of these particles as a function of time. So th this is really about 10 years ago. So that's, uh, that, that's um, as most you can get out of AFM back then. Uh, you don't see much details on these filaments, at least, but at least you can measure the dimensions, right? And so they are very clear that way. So we've done also a lot of these experiments with different proteins. So in this case, I'm showing you two data, uh, four data sets. Uh, so, uh, so we have beta-2M, so uh, beta-LAC and lysosome. So these, uh, I would consider them to be model systems, maybe not directly linked with disease. And we have alpha synuclein, which is a, a, a disease-associated amyloid, especially uh, we are, uh, we're still doing everything in vitro, as you say but that one has the, the closest association to disease in the sense that we form them on the physiological pH and all that. Uh, and it has a, a human disease associated uh, protein sequence, okay? Um, 
and then we basically we characterize the the, uh, the size distribution. So uh, in terms of the length distribution and the height distribution, which is kind of a corresponding to the width of your filaments. And basically we saw that width is really doesn't, doesn't change, at least under our experimental conditions. But the height, uh, and sorry, the, the length distribution, it does change. So we're shortening the filaments without breaking them up uh, laterally, if you will. So this is where uh, I started to talk uh, with uh, Marie and Magali because uh, uh, Marie is obviously an uh, expert on the gross fragmentation and that was a great idea to have them look at the, the pure fragmentation reactions, right? Uh, and there were challenges. Uh, so we set up a model so that, uh, with uh, really simple assumptions. One is that uh, if you have a amyloid of length Y, you can just make two fi fibrils. Uh, so that the y length, length of parent will get, get into two daughters with x and uh, y minus x in length. And uh, so to make more, we just, so each step will basically one uh, particle divided into two particles. Uh, and we also look at the, the case where there is uh, a symmetry. So uh, basically if you break it here, it's the same as you break it there because your daughters, uh, they will have the same length, okay? So this might not be actually, now that we know about amyloid, this might not be as good assumption. It turned out to be that uh, with the current today's knowledge, amyloid is actually, uh, it has a directionality. So uh, I don't know, uh, something for us to think about, I guess. Uh, and uh, so I'm just showing you uh, kind of a, a, a the master equation, if you will. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you guys doing math. Uh, I mean, you've seen a lot of these before. I'm I'm coloring them in because it helps me. <laughs> so um, basically, this is a pure fragmentation equation. So you have basically the time evolution of the species distribution. So uh, when I say species distribution, it's really about length distribution in this case. And that's uh, the um, equivalent to uh, the disappearance of your parent fibrils because they break and appearance of smaller daughter particles uh, with a, a, a certain type of kernel. Uh, so the, the, the properties we're interested in is basically the, uh, the division rate constant, uh, which it, uh, has a power law dependence. So you want to have the alpha and gamma parameters. Uh, and you're also uh, in some ways interested in the kernel, uh, but mainly at the moment, I think we are focused on the um, really, uh, in terms of uh, looking at experimental data, we're really uh, looking at this, but uh, we are all, of course interested in the kernel as well, which it turned out to be a much uh, bigger challenge also from mathematical point of view, uh, especially when your data is noisy. Uh, now, I, I'm sure I'm not ex uh, explaining it in, in, into sufficient detail, and I'm not really giving the mathematical work justice. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, so uh, Marie, Miguel, and uh, Magali uh, has, a, has a paper on this uh, subject. Um, uh, that's really beyond my abilities. Uh, but we also published one paper where we look at the data, uh, and one that's really looking at uh, you know, at the workflow that one can have to extract the information. So if you're interested, you can, uh, I recommend you those uh, three papers, uh, no matter if you are from experimental point of view or from theory point of view. Um, just trying to summarize what we found out. Uh, let me check how I'm doing on time. Okay, so um, uh, we found a few properties that's really interesting and that's really helpful for experimentalists as well. So first, first of all, for a pure fragmentation uh, scenario, uh, we have the case where if you wait long enough, uh, the shape of your uh, length distribution, so uh, it won't change anymore. So uh, what do I mean by shape? I guess for experimentalists, I just say, hey, plot the distribution, they're gonna have a similar shape if you rescale the, the axis. But uh, from theory point of view, uh, it's really every single moment, I, I think, is uh, exactly, uh, you know, can be, um, uh, once you rescale it, you have the same moments, essentially, I think is the, the right way to say it. Uh, and this is a very uh, nice property uh, because that means that we are not in a rush to do the experiment very quickly. In fact, uh, because we are looking at long time behavior, we do have time to prepare our samples. Right, so immediately give us some uh, hint. Uh, and secondly, if you wait long enough, uh, then you can plot, uh, in this case, the mean length, which is uh, the, the, the first moment of your distribution. 
uh, it's gonna all fall onto the same line, okay? So this is also very nice. That means that uh, independently where you start, uh, if you wait long enough, you're gonna end up on this uh, line, which it tells you about the time scale of the, uh, of the division process. So again, to experimentalists, it's very nice. It tells you, don't worry if your sample A and sample B, they are not having the same starting point. If you wait long enough, they're gonna end up uh, in a regime where you can uh, you know, measure them with an uh, equal uh, chance of giving you uh, good information, all right? So, uh, so in this case, um, uh, if you have uh, some uh, main length, so your distribution is under this line, they actually go really, really slowly, and then uh, once they fall this line, they go here. So this is the stable region, which is uh, the reason why uh, our experiments, our points usually start off, uh, if not on the, on the line, then on the stable point is that amyloid is very stable. In order to kick off the fragmentation reaction, we actually need to perturb it. So perturbation make it so that uh, you, you kick them off off into a more, uh, you know, uh, a regime where they are more likely to react, uh, divide on the experimentally observable time, time scales, right? So that's why we tend to start here. But of course, uh, if you do a simulation, you start up there, they're just gonna keep uh, quickly uh, revert to this line. So this is the, I would guess, uh, the, the, the metastable area. Uh, I would call that, I don't know if Maria agrees. <laughs> we had a lot of a discussion about this, but we never end up in here. It's because if you're here, that means your sample is not really that stable, uh, which means, uh, the, you know, they are already in a, uh, in a way that you don't have to perturb them further for them to go. So we never end up in this uh, area, I think, experimentally. So we are safe. And then, uh, finally, if you look at the kernel, so you can have different fragmentation kernels. So basically, you can say that they only divide in the middle, the, the filaments, or divide something like this, or they have a uniform uh, division, so uh, the likelihood of they dividing anywhere, anywhere in the filaments is the same, or the opposite, that it's more likely to st shed stuff on the ends. So it has a very big impact on how your uh, shape of your uh, distribution when they are at this, uh, what we call some uh, asymptotic line look like. And in the case for, uh, I'm gonna show you uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the kernel uh, that give you different responses that you can divide them into two classes. The, the first class is you have very small, a lot of small species. And the other class is you have a peak uh, that's not small, it's somewhere else essentially. And this is important because one reason we're interested in division is because it might produce a lot of small species that could be you know, very, uh, active biologically, so that might not be as good. You know, so uh, even if you can just uh, come up with data that tells you which class of uh, kernel you, you have, is already uh, very important information. Uh, and finally, uh, we look at the rate constant. Uh, we uh, model it as a, a power law. So we have alpha, which is kind of like the time scale of the uh, things, and then gamma is basically the length dependence of, uh, of your rate uh, constant and they basically change this asymptotic line, either you're moving them parallel, if you plot them on log log plot, uh, size versus time, uh, or they change uh, the slope. So it gives you an experimental readout. So if you can characterize what uh, this uh, asymptotic line look like, it then more or less tells you all the things that you want to know about the, the pure fragmentation reactions, which is great, okay? So for experimentalists, uh, you know, you don't have to, uh, be anxious to get your reaction started. You can make sure you have good samples and they're gonna be comparable, uh, which is important because if you wait long enough, any sample, um, they're gonna end up on this line. And this line is what we need to characterize essentially. Yes. Uh, uh, that's a very good question. We do have heterogeneity, but uh, at the time when we measure this, we're looking some kind of uh, average behavior, uh, I would say. Okay, so the heterogeneity is, uh, it's in fact, uh, you'll see me proposing it as a future challenge. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, so um, on our first four proteins when we compared, uh, we basically compared alpha cyanucleic fibrils, which are closest uh, uh, system we see that's disease associated, and they tend to be actually less stable toward breakage compared to other model amyloid systems, because if you look at the rate, uh, they tend to be here, uh, which is um, higher than the other one. So there's also the lysozyme, which is uh, uh, kind of a, um, 
uh, also uh, has a high rate, but the difference is these alpha synuclein fibrils, they are a lot wider, so, uh, so they are uh, a much more unstable uh, compared to the, the cross-sectional width, I would say. Uh, and they also likely to shed small species, as in the, you have uh, the, the small uh, species at the length scale here for the distribution, you have uh, kind of a quite high uh, amount, uh, as you say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's uh, this is the correlation. Uh, so it's kind of plotted different way. It's plotted uh, length versus time on this to show you the experimental data onto the same plot. But this is the uh, basically the division rate constant. So this basically tells you the likelihood of a filament of certain length. Uh, will break, yeah. Uh, no, the, the, the slope is tells you uh, the length dependence of it. You read about the absolute number. So for example, for, uh, for 100, uh, okay, let's do a 10 nanometer uh, filament. Uh, then you read it as uh, it's uh, beta lactoglobulin is the most stable, and then followed by the black, which is the beta uh, beta 2 m, and then also of synuclein and the lysozyme. So basically, you read off the division rate constant. Okay. Uh, the gamma is the slope of this. Yeah. But the uh, uh, the uh, so alpha length uh, to the power of gamma tells you exactly what what it is for a certain length. Um, it's uh, it's uh, it's assumption. But uh, it has a statistical, statistical thermodynamics analysis uh, as a background uh, that when people look at it, uh, it looks like it, it can follow a power law. A lot of physical uh, processes follow, follow power law. So I would say it has the empirical uh, content in this assumption. Uh, so what can we use this information for? We can obviously compare the stability of all our amyloid types, but we can also, uh, so if you know all the, uh, the alpha, gamma, and uh, you, you have kind of a good uh, um, idea about which class of kappa, uh, so the kernel is, you can actually take the initial distribution, you can predict any other time, and the, the predictions, uh, which is like the solid line here, really follows well the experiments. So, so this is uh, to to us, it's really big success because we haven't actually done anything. We literally used the uh, the data set to really uh, get those three parameters, and yet, all the, uh, if you know all three, you, you can predict any time uh, behavior essentially. Uh, the alpha parameter, the gamma parameter. Uh, and uh, the the kappa, which is the kernel, the, the fragmentation kernel. Yep. Okay. So now, uh, of course, uh, that was uh, b before pandemic, and uh, during the pandemic, uh, uh, I, I know I'm crazy dad, right? So I'm uh, I'm trying to get my uh, a one year old boy into science. So what do you do? You give him a amyloid model. We have like uh, I've get, I've given this as a present uh, because you can pr 3D print amyloid model. Uh, you can give it as a toy, I guess. Um, so, so that's Alexander thinking, well, technically it's me thinking, uh, if only there are more of these amyloid models, each with different shapes to play with. Now, we haven't looked at uh, the, the shapes, we haven't looked at the organization, um, spatial organization of uh, the filaments in any way. So we assume that we're basically looking at the average behavior of our population. Um, but it just turned out to be that uh, we're basically now in the second part. Let's see, I'm not massively going over time. Uh, so in the second part, so the first part, I talked about uh, the kinetic mechanisms, the dynamics, and we were focusing on uh, division, right? The second part is talking about what if you have very heterogeneous mixtures? Uh, what can we do about this? Uh, first of all, do we have uh, a lot of different structures? So we are uh, looking at the second question mark, and the answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, in the last few years, uh, throughout the pandemic, people being busy trying to determine the structure, uh, when talking about the high resolution structure where you can actually see where the atoms are uh, in the core of amyloid fibrils, 
I would say core, uh, because it's hard to be very important, especially given Human's talk about what happens, uh, you know, outside the core. But the uh, the core, of, so the, these uh, little doodles, uh, they are basically the cross section of your filaments. Each each example where the filament is going uh, in and out of the plane of the display here. Okay, so you're looking at the cross section of filaments, and we actually wrote a review last year, and but this is already. Uh, if you read it, it's already out of date simply because people are generating so much data. Uh, prior electron microscopy for, um, you know, for generating structural information is really taking off in the last few years. Uh, and uh, what people have seen initially with cryo uh, you know, a lab A uh, determinate structure and lab B determinate structure, they look different, and you're thinking which lab is correct. Uh, but now we have so many structures, it's hard to be that everybody's correct. It's just uh, they are slightly different. And uh, this is a really big manifestation of uh, the core challenge with amyloid in the sense that you can have uh, the formation of, uh, you know, subtly or even non subtly different structures from one single amino acid sequence. Okay, so that's the heterogeneity. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the question I'm going to answer here. <laughs> uh, so thank, thanks. Uh, I'm glad that you also thought that was a very important question. Uh, so I, I just say definitely not uh, is the answer, but I'm going to give you some experimental evidence. Um, uh, now, the, uh, the cryo-EM structures, uh, I'm a bi big fan. That's why we did this review, right? So just look at them. They are so different. What's, what the heck is going on? Uh, so if you have all these structures, you know, which one do we need to care about in biology or do we care about all of them? You know, that's a big question, right? So, uh, but also, if you understand the EM workflow, it's a very much an average method, okay? So the high resolution structure where you can see where the atoms are uh, in, uh, you know, you have uh, enough resolution in your electron density map to see the atoms, it, see within quotes. Um, you have to average over a lot of a uh, lot of uh, boxes, so a lot of um, you know seg segments, uh, which comes from a lot of particles. So you get basically the highest populated uh, uh, you know species when you do this sort of uh, determination. But we are interested in populations, right? We want to know not just the highly populated one. We want to know as complete a population description as possible. And to that, we go back to, uh, well, the, the, the method that we employ a lot that we also develop in our lab is, uh, again, AFM. So I'm showing you again this uh, data set from 2013, so uh, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, you more or less don't see any details. You can, you can measure the, uh, the dimensions. Um, and uh, so AFM, uh, just a little bit of background what, what it actually is. Uh, so it's basically stands for atomic force microscopy. It's type of scanning probe microscopy. So the major advantage is, uh, one of the major advantage is uh, that, uh, well, one of the advantage, advantages you can do it in ambient conditions, like in liquids, uh, Human showed you liquid-based stuff, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, biologically much more gentle, I would say. Um, but it's also high signal to noise. If you look at uh, electron, um, cryo electron microscopy images, they look very noisy, black and white, uh, noisy images. So you really have to have a lot of information to be able to segment any stuff from, from a data set. But it's still really cool. I mean, we heard earlier today, Alva's talk, uh, we saw that it is possible to, uh, you know, to uh, even uh, uh, with the, the sort of uh, really noisy, uh, image sets eventually with computational help, you can actually segment a lot of information from it. So the advantage of AFM in this case is that it's high signal noise. So all you need to have is one single observation of a particle, then you'll have enough information to uh, decipher its uh, uh, surface envelope. So it's a structural identification of some sort. Uh, and I would say currently the resolution is somewhere between tomography uh, and uh, cryo-EM tomography and cryo-EM uh, single particle analysis. Um, so it's intermediate in terms of resolution, but you only need literally one image. If you see something once, it's there essentially, and you can 
uh, reconstruct. So that's the major advantage. So how can uh, how can I say that? I mean, uh, so these guys, uh, the AFM uh, Nobel Prize winners, they we're talking about the 80s. They got uh, they share half of the Nobel Prize with the what considered to be granddad of uh, electron microscopy. But since then, uh, e uh, prior EM for biological applications, they they got they got I think another Nobel Prize in 2017. Uh, yeah, I was just not sure. Is this 2017? Yeah, so we have Richard Henderson and uh, et al. Uh, so three people. Uh, but uh, AFM is kind of remaining quite niche in the sense that people use it to do sizing and just to uh, look at uh, you know stuff uh, without looking at it quantitatively and see what, you, what else you can get out of those images. And also we have a lot of uh, technological advancements. So these days, AFM, you can control the exact force you are probing your molecule with, and you can do it with an uh, incredible amount of uh, uh, you know, sensitivity in the sense that you can detect force in the piconewton range. So how much is a piconewton? So the rupture force of a covalent bond is in the thousands of piconewtons. The rupture force of a hydrogen bond, so the bond between two water molecules, uh, you know, uh, is a single digit piconewton. So you can, with AFM, reach that range, okay? So routinely, maybe we don't do uh, single digit piconewton. We certainly can do uh, double digit uh, piconewtons, uh, maybe 100 piconewton or something. Uh, it's doable, even with just ambient conditions, okay? So we're talking about literally, we can measure the force uh, that's on order of uh, magnitude similar to the, the force need to break two water molecules from each other. So that, if you think about it, it's quite amazing. You know, uh, but what can you do with it? So an uh, issue which people know about it for a long, very long time is that the images you're getting is not a true representation uh, of uh, your molecules, right? Uh, because uh, they, um, they have a so-called tip sample convolution effect. So in the sense that the recorded three-dimensional coordinate is not actually the, uh, the three-dimensional coordinate of your sample. Uh, but uh, recently we developed a way to preserve that information. So in the old days, you do uh, uh, erosion deconvolution to at least get the sizing right, but you lost a lot of structural information. Now, uh, our new algorithms, we literally, for each of uh, um, the, measure, the pixel, res uh, pixel level measurements, we can translate this into actual contact point, which means that you really have uh, what we consider to be uh, good correction uh, so that we know the actual three-dimensional coordinate of your surface envelope for your molecules you're looking at. Now, one major issue is, of course, the tip radius. Uh, so uh, at the moment, we're trying out as sharp tip uh, as possible. So that's still a concern. But nevertheless, uh, what you can do these days, uh, so certainly we're, we're doing this routinely in our lab, is now every single filament that you see, you can see a lot of details. I'm showing you these uh, really high-quality images where each filament, each single observation of a filament, you can reconstruct uh, a three-dimensional surface envelope model. Uh, so one observation, one model. Instead of an uh, average over many, many thousands, uh, get one model, all right? So this is a major uh, breakthrough in my, in my view because um, uh, it's really allow you to look at the individuality and structural variation. So you, you can map the population of your particles, uh, uh, one particle at a time, right? So it really uh, look at uh, you know variations in structures uh, a lot more in detail. Um, yes. Uh, so I think that's probably. Uh, I can't remember, to be honest, that I would guess it's 100 nanometers. So the width of these filaments, they are below 10 nanometers. Okay. So good point. I need to label it better. I <laughs> just uh, uh, cut it off and didn't cut off the, uh, the, the legend. <laughs> so, yeah. No, uh, they have variations. So in cryo EM, you select, uh, you know, you select the one that's most consistent. In, uh, in this type of reconstruction, you, you don't really mind, right? So what we do is we pick, we peak pick, uh, and therefore the periodicity is really what you can see uh, for each individual, uh, you know, uh, pitch. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. This is literally an example of uh, filament one, filament two, filament three. You can do it for any other filament here too. Yeah. 
So uh, we tested this approach on a model system that form amyloid. So these are short peptides that form amyloid structures. And for these, uh, really, if you look at it, every single filament is different. So there's individuality uh, in your sample. So with the old AFM uh, imaging, you won't be able to distinguish that at all, but now we can. Uh, and we literally can uh, just, just uh, take every single filament and analyze them. So uh, my postdoc in this case done hundreds of these, uh, literally, uh, which in retrospect is probably a small number now. You really want to do more. And for each observation, we can start to construct uh, these uh, 3D models, okay? So these are literally 3D envelopes. Uh, so just uh, to remind you mathematicians, this is uh, really interesting uh, in my view, and I certainly don't understand that uh, well enough what some of the things you want to do. And yeah, so we've done, we've done hundreds of these, uh, literally every single one. And now you already see that some filaments, they look like each other. And everyone is different, but some are closer relative to others than uh, other groups, okay? So you can start to thinking about, can we do some kind of distance measure, similarity measure, uh, to classify them uh, uh, quantitatively, uh, which is exactly what we've done. So, of course, uh, we don't know how the best way to extract information from three-dimensional shapes. So I basically come up with... Uh, uh, a few what we call uh, morphometric parameters. So basically parameters where I think has a lot of information content. And we put them together. So in this case, we have a five dimensional space. I'm just showing you a 2D projection from two of the parameters. So in this case, the directional periodic frequency tells you about the, the twist and the average height, which tells you about the width. So even if you plot these, you can start to see that uh, the population distribution is highly dependent on the sequence. Okay, so you have the case, uh, so one thing uh, of interest is amyloid is usually considered to be generally left-hand twisted, but for some sequence, you have populations both left and right twisted, okay? So you can also see the clusters. Uh, so these are, uh, if you imagine uh, these uh, energy landscape uh, doodles I've showed you, you imagine you're looking at from above because the occurrence literally tells you about population and it tells you about the assembly landscape, all right? And then we can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so directly, uh, so this is, uh, yeah, exactly, it's a frequency. Yeah, so it's basically the frequency of these uh, periods, essentially. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm over time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anyway, so let, let me go to the end and then we can talk afterwards. So basically we can classify them because uh, uh, we can measure uh, kind of similarity in some ways. It's not perfect, that's why I want to uh, have your opinion, how the best way to measure distance between three-dimensional objects, essentially. Um, yeah, so this is what I'm saying, essentially looking at the assembly landscape from above and this is, uh, um, you know, population, it's a one type of visualization of the population we've got. And to answer then the question that you asked uh, in the beginning, so if you have different polymorphs, do they have different stabilities to division? So one way to generate different polymorphs is if you have single uh, amino acid mutations. In this case, we took alpha synuclein because it's a, a disease-linked uh, sequence. And they, uh, we uh, choose two different uh, single point mutations where in the literature they literally say those are very important because they are linked to familiar Parkinson's disease. And uh, people also looked at how they look like, and then they clearly are different to wild type. Uh, and we uh, basically looked at the polymorphism of these, and we saw that they are different. Yeah, so you can see that uh, if you look at the, on filament level, they are different. So I'm showing you the cross-section along the filament axis uh, that you have different you know, periodic behavior. And then you do the uh, fragmentation reaction again and apply our analysis. So we basically look at the uh, length distribution change as time and height distribution change as time. So the height distribution is very well preserved, while length distribution is actually uh, moving as you would expect. And we apply our model again, and this is what we got out. So you clearly see that different polymorphs, they're kind of similar. They are the same sequence, uh, similar in size, but they behave very differently. To, uh, to the perturbation we get. So they have different amyloid uh, fragmentation stabilities, uh, different polymorphs. 
so in summary, uh, I basically showed you kind of a, that uh, together with the Marie, um, Magali, and uh, Miguel, we kind of uh, looked at the pure fork amputation models. Uh, I think we did a very good job. Uh, not thanks to me. <laughs> uh, and uh, using this uh, kind of approach, we can easily extract uh, information from the time evolution of size distributions. But I also showed you the new development in the sense that we can now decipher not just the size, but also the polymorph distribution. Uh, and we showed uh, evidence that different polymorphs of the same amyloid type, they do have distinguishable fragmentation stabilities. So they have different likelihood of dividing, essentially. Uh, even uh, if you, Huma, if you argue we are doing it in vitro, uh, but at least you can say that they are different enough so that they, are, they have different stabilities toward division. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, recently people are really interested in, uh, you know, individual particle level behavior. And uh, talking to my colleagues uh, in Amilo conferences, uh, people look at different growth dynamics and different, uh, they, saw, they saw basically individual filaments, uh, the elongation seemed to be different. Uh, uh, for different polymorphs. And they also say to see that different polymorphs, they interact with cellular proteins like chaperones differently. So clearly, one needs to know about, uh, you know, what population you've got, not just uh, the most uh, prevalent uh, species, but really look at the population as a whole uh, in terms of ju not just the size, but also the, the, the polymorphic structure. Um, so uh, what are the challenges? So I'm, I have two slides. I'm sorry I'm uh, over time a little bit, uh, but uh, let me quickly uh, suggest what I think is uh, important. So first of all, the dynamics, right? So now that we know that in the past we've looked at some kind of average behavior, which explains uh, some stuff, but not all. Uh, now, now that we know that we have population like this, uh, how does it affect dynamics, right? So for example, uh, do we need to do anything to growth fragmentation models to take into account that uh, not just the size, but you know, the type of structures we've got? Can we um, basically look at uh, behaviors of multiple individual polymorphs, like say, uh, separately and together? And so when you put them together into uh, the same uh, population, does it add anything uh, to their behavior? So, um, so we also look at the time evolution of the continuum of species. That, 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 it's really nice to know, right? Uh, and uh, if you have competition, I mean, I'm sure there is competition. Uh, so I'm talking about these guys more and more like uh, if they are cells or virus particles, you may notice. Uh, and of course, uh, um, can they mutate? So if you have one type of structure, can they mutate into a different type of structure? Uh, that's a big question. I'm very interested in this. Uh, any cross interaction? So I told you about the the uh, uh, the recent study we've done to show that you can have cross interactions between different amyloid structures. Um, one type of uh, you know structure can influence the um, behavior of another uh, structure uh, rec very recently. So clearly, there might be cross interactions in your population, right? So mutations and cross interactions is something that different structures might, might do, uh, which will complicate uh, the, the, gro the simple gross, gross, uh, growth fragmentation case. And of course, impact of rate versus kernel. So if you have something that have very similar uh, division rates, but they have different patterns of division, does it, does it uh, does it make one more likely to have better fitness than the other? I don't know. Uh, so that will put highlights on uh, kernel information a bit more as well. And of course, uh, what is fitness for amyloid? I mean, we're talking about not, not a live entity here. So what kind of stuff do we need to know in order to decide whether something's fit or not for the environment they are in? Right, so th these are all big questions, and uh, I'm showing you like uh, some ideas, cross interactions here. So one type of amyloid can uh, maybe interact with another type of structure. So I showed you the, this type of uh, visualization for population. So if you can imagine you have a big, wide population, and uh, you then put them into condition one, then they may shift this way, and you put this in condition two, it might shift the other way. Okay, uh, and, and if you, uh, then have uh, something that comes from condition two that overlap with condition one, maybe you can jump species. I don't know, uh, you know. And of course, this is going back to Collins and Clark's uh, classic paper in science where they talk about these 
uh, clouds of species. That is what that picture is for prion species, uh, prion uh, strings, uh, phenotypes. Uh, so um, uh, the other uh, new challenge is the the structure organization itself. Can we basically use fre frequency domain information? So we are doing direct space reconstruction. Look at the 3D coordinates and uh, reconstruct surface envelope that way. But uh, you can look at uh, the, the 1D and the 2D uh, Fourier transform. They, I think they contain a lot of information that is being missed. So if you guys uh, know what ways you can use frequency uh, domain information to uh, infer spatial domain uh, kind of uh, shapes, uh, very welcome to talk to me. Uh, classification, uh, again, uh, we are doing it very roughly by me deciding what parameters, uh, you know, could be important, but are there any good mathematical ways of, uh, you know, very objectively deciding what the information content is in these three-dimensional shapes? Um, distance or similarity measures, uh, am I doing the right thing here? Again, uh, this is also for classification is important, right? Um, and just, just simple things, how do you represent these uh, population distributions? Uh, both in terms of uh, formulas, math mathematic, uh, math math mathematical representation, or for visualization. So I'm showing you some visualization before, but of course uh, that doesn't tell you the whole picture, right? So we need some kind of a dimensionality reduction because you don't want to show millions of these uh, to show you the population. You want to have some kind of visualization that tells you an overview of what kind of population you have. So I think that's prerequisite also to understand the dynamics of uh, you know very diverse population of stuff. So these are the challenges I'm very much thinking about. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, have any ideas or your uh, specialties go into some of these areas. Uh, I'm happy to talk about that later. Otherwise, thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry I went over time a little bit. Happy to discuss later. And uh, it, well, again, he's saying it because I'm, uh, I don't know, um, as a proud dad, I obviously want him to go into science, I should say. <laughs> so better start early by giving him some models to play with, okay? Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, and again, I want to thank everybody, uh, as well as uh, more again, Magali and Marie for really nice collaboration. Uh, and uh, my funding bodies. So thank you very much. Happy to discuss uh, later on as well. Thank you.